so we didn't know if we would get you know, a large crowd, but this is a quality crowd. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to individualize this thing because this is a, on the verge, this is almost more of an economic development topic, which, you know, if we had chambers of commerce people here and city council members and people on industrial development boards and, and those kinds of uh, people, they would, uh, they're the ones that have been mostly involved in the development of these types of programs. But uh, Bob and I thought, you know what, and, and uh, the role of the senior centers in the communities and the fact that these senior centers are becoming more and more involved with uh, expanding their role, you know, they originally started just nutrition centers, just what we used to call them years ago, and the people would show up, and, you know, for a free meal, or they didn't mind paying for it. Well, what we found was, yeah, they didn't mind paying for it because they were looking for interaction. They were wanting contact. Well, and then you, you know, think of that model, and then you think of the AMP program that they talked about just a little while ago, where they're bringing in all these educational components and bringing in people. Uh, so the role that the senior, uh, senior citizen center, for lack of a better term, plays in the community. Now, this is my first trip to Columbus, Indiana, and I want to tell you that I'm thoroughly impressed with this place. And uh, I walked all around town this morning, and what I've done for all my probably 25 years is to assess places for retirement to determine what strengths would this place have for retirees? What things could they do to improve? And I can tell you that this place is strong all the way around. Uh, since I've been here, I uh, came in to Indianapolis yesterday. Bob's wife was kind enough to pick me up. Coming in here, everybody I've met at this Mill Race Center, I mean, this thing in itself is amazing. When you think about the communities, the senior centers in the past, and you see this place, uh, the people, the people in the area, all around, is just so clean and nice. The people are bright, they're uh, considerate, they're courteous. People are an amenity. Having friendly people in your community is is a huge amenity because when people are looking to relocate for retirement. Um, they have a fear of not being able to meet people and maybe not being able to connect. But they're looking to get connected more. They've had these dreams of what happiness would be in retirement for many years. But, uh, so, let me say that uh, we have all these statistics out there on, on the site that she mentioned. And I have a book on the uh, aspects of retirement development, all program aspects, all the research background, anything you want to know if you wanted to get into uh, an effort to try to bring more retirees to your community. So, uh, and then I have some research I want to share from this Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail experience uh, to, that actually demonstrates the economic impact that these folks have on the community, on the state. So I want to share some of that stuff with you, but I'd really like to uh, do whatever I can to help you get something out of the session. And I'll be around until tomorrow, and, and uh, we're scheduled here for an hour and a half, but we, what we can do, we can go 30 or 40 minutes. I can give you somewhat of a canned, canned presentation. And then we can take a short stretch break, whatever, and then I, we, you know, we can really answer questions, interact, share, whatever we want to do. So um, I want to share a few websites with you, so I'll probably go to the back. And, and uh, the one story I want to start with is uh, has to do with... Uh, you, you may be saying, and I know if we go back to, if we get back now, 
backtrack to about 1990. Uh, in Alabama, we had a, we have a lot of rural areas in the state of Alabama. A lot of small towns spread out as, well, about six hours from one end of the state to the other, north to south. Some of you may have been there, but anyway, uh, we've had an image problem for years, okay? It goes all the way back to the 60s. You probably uh, remember George Wallace standing in the school door. You probably remember on black and white television with police dogs and fire hoses. So uh, we didn't have much going on economic development-wise. Job creation was hard, especially in those rural areas. U.S. Steel that had a uh, pipe mill in Birmingham and few other plants here and there and timber and agriculture were huge you know as far as the industry and there wasn't a whole lot there well if you don't have a lot of uh, industry then you don't have a lot of revenue you don't have good jobs for your people then your services aren't very good so that was sort of the situation we were in and, and I retired I excuse me graduated from Alabama, University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and went up to northeastern Alabama at Jacksonville State University. It's about two hours out of Atlanta, two hours out of Birmingham, two hours out of Chattanooga, foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. It's a pretty place, freshwater lakes, mountains, uh, a lot of friendly people. But uh, we didn't know, the communities wanted to know what could we do to create jobs for our children and our grandchildren. And so we, we got a grant through our Center for Economic Development in our business school. I was working over in the Department of Sociology and Social Work, developing a social work program. And we, we got with the uh, Center for Economic Development and we formed a team of researchers at the university, faculty members that were willing to work extra and get paid extra, in addition to teaching your classes, to go out and research in these counties uh, what they could do, we called it, let's determine their best fit strategy. And so we found out that they really couldn't compete in what we call silicon chip sweepstakes or the smokestack chasing. They didn't have the land, they didn't have the water, they didn't have the labor, they didn't have the roads, et cetera, et cetera. But we did find that they had what tourists and retirees wanted. They were quiet, safe, uh, housing was very reasonable, had access to health care. And so we said, we think you need to look at tourism. And uh, also retirees. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, we think you need to. You know, I think you need to bring retirees in. Bring more old people in here? <laughs> How, you know, are you crazy? And we said, well, no, we really... And they said, well, what would it mean <clears throat> if we brought old people in here? Wouldn't that be more people for us to have to take care of? And they're going to end up on end up in a nursing home and all that stuff? And I'm like, no. The people that can move for retirement are different than those that age in place. And those people have a lot of financial assets. And they have incomes that come in even in downturns in the economy. And they bring those assets with them. And they bring expertise with them. And they start to spend their money. And they start to create jobs. And they uh, help improve the quality of life in your, your community. And it's clean industry. And you don't have to set up an industrial board and go out and buy land and offer incentives to a company that's going to come in and because here's the thing there are 30,000 communities chasing those 300 plants that are relocating each year if you're not in a recession a national recession and uh, a lot of places have to give away all you know tax abatements training all sorts of incentives to try to get these companies to come like Zach mentioned last night, they high five. Yeah, we got you know it's a ribbon cutting. Politicians love it. That plant can close. <laughs> they can leave, and so 
So here's, we found out, they said, well, what would it mean if we brought 100 retiree households? So I, I started researching and I found basically there wasn't much in the literature. There were a few agricultural economists and a few uh, social gerontologists that had looked into retiree migration. People in the business school, no, they hadn't even think about older people very much. And so what we found was, found a model uh, in Arkansas where farmland and farmers had turned land into a retirement community and they, he looked at the comparison and uh, what he found was, was one retiree household relocated to a community had the same economic impact as 3.7 factory jobs. When you look at what's called a leakage model because even though you have a, a factory job right here, um, workers come from other counties, a lot of that payroll goes instantly out of the county. You know, you've got federal taxes, state taxes, social security, pensions, other things, and the amount of money that stays in the community is what causes the economic development. So, the, we said there are two basic strategies for economic development. One, you either produce something through agriculture or manufacturing and you sell it outside the area and people bring, I mean, you know, the money comes in, right? The other strategy is just have people bring money to your area, okay? <laughs> Let them come and guess what? If, you, do you know if you can get a tourist to stop off, stopping here off of the interstate out there? If you can get them to stay here three hours, they'll start spending money because their body fluids start to deplete. <laughs> okay? So, uh, you know, Florida and these other states were very popular with uh, tourism. And, uh, but then we started looking at retirees in Florida and we found out, you know what? That's driving a big part of that economic engine down there. And then we started looking at, okay, you start looking at states and we're saying, okay, so historically, retirees have been moving from northeast, colder areas up the northeast to Florida, Midwest to Arizona. And so Arizona was, in the 60s, were building planned, large planned retirement communities like Sun City, the company called Dale Webb. Arkansas had uh, Cooper communities. And here again, what also started to occurred to me was tourism areas evolve into retirement areas. Because where people retire, there's a predisposing experience. They either were tourists there, stationed in the military, went to college, had a vacation home. And uh, so people, the reason, and the way Florida got going with this, people vacationed down there a lot, wanted to go to the beaches. And so when they kept thinking about retirement, they, they thought about where they had fun when they were doing their vacations, but then they got to Florida and they found out, well, you know, it's, I'm not gonna tell you it's depressing looking at palm trees all the time, but it's either raining or it's not. It's the weather change down there, you know? It's not the four season climate. And so what we started to see was halfbacks. <laughs> People that were from the Northeast, Massachusetts, whatever, wanted to get New York, I'll say this, Miami is as far south as you can go and still be in Long Island. <laughs> so they were coming to Florida, they were staying a year or two, missing the four seasons, bouncing halfway back, say, to North Carolina, Arkansas. So, and then and it was getting expensive along the coastlines, so, you know, the coastlines were filling up, the deserts were filling up, and so freshwater lakes started to become more popular and uh, mountains. As these are what we call amenities, retirement amenities. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk to you and make sure you understand the difference. There are three types of retirees, migrating retirees. There, there are amenity migrants. And this is in the, I mean, you, fine if you want to take notes, but we'll, it's all in the, in the package here. Uh, amenity migrants are those retirees that are looking for the amenities of an area. And let me quickly add right now, I just mentioned those uh, 
geographical amenities, but also child, grandchildren. That is becoming a very popular amenity that they want to be near those grandchildren. So, i.e., Columbus has a lot going for it in regard to that because of the central location when you look at St. Louis and Chicago, you know, proximity to Louisville, Cincinnati, and those places. Uh, so, amenity migrants are usually the healthiest and uh, wealthiest and most educated of all those uh, retiree migrants, okay? And everybody goes after those. And when I say everybody, when we, once we started talking about this in, the, in 1990 and, and I got involved and we got the first statewide program together in state government, what we did, we went to, and I realize I sort of jumped around a little bit, but I am gonna pull it all back together. Um, so we got, uh, we went to the governor's office and we started working on the governor saying, look, we have an office to attract tourists and we have an office to attract industry, but we don't have anything to attract retirees. And we've been researching this for six, seven years and we think that we need to do this. And so the governor said, okay. So we put it in the Alabama Department of Economic and Community Affairs, and we started that in, like we started in 88, 89, 90, 91. And what we did was we sent out a questionnaire to all the 428 municipalities in the state, and we said, if you want to be a part of this program, fill out this questionnaire, give us some information about you. And so we got back 70 to start with. And so the train had to pull out. So we started that, we, we printed the, uh, I wrote a guide to retiring in Alabama, okay? And we included all the information about uh, the communities, a brief description on each one, and a, a brief description of the main things that retirees are looking for. And we, uh, we got some advertising. We did a brochure, eight panel color brochure that we put out in our welcome areas, and welcome centers, rest areas. And then we, we ran some advertising in senior publications. And some of y'all may know about those, uh, what, what in those days they called them mature market newspapers that with content geared strictly for those 50 and over. Well, we, we, got, we generated a whole lot of inquiries, and so when they would respond to the ad, we would, or the, turn in the brochure, the back of the brochure, we would send them a copy of that guide to retirement. And in there, we had a, a bingo card that they would, that they, if they were, you know, all 70 of our communities, if they wanted more information about Gunnersville or Fairhope or Ufala, they would check it. And then we, we started creating this list of leads and then we would send those leads out each month to the Chamber of Commerce, let's say in Gunnersville. All right, so Gunnersville gets this list of 20 people that are interested in retiring in Gunnersville, Alabama. So then they needed to prepare some literature to respond to it. So we got some matching money where we could match grants to help them pre uh, prepare a community brochure on retirement. And um, Basically, a, a, a brochure for retirement is different than a tourism brochure. Tourism brochure is more sizzle. The retirement brochure has to be more substance because retirees wanting to relocate to an area, they, want, they have hard questions. The people at the state tourism office, they, they did not want to deal with this because they said, we don't have the people to answer all the questions when these people call us wanting to know about what are the taxes, mm -hmm. what are, you know, how's the real estate, How's the health care? And so they're like, we really don't, we, yeah, Governor, we don't want to do this. We think an agency that strictly deals with this would be good. So, uh, so we started working on these local governments. And so I would go out and do a talk like this, maybe to a Kiwanis group or some group. Because what happened was we started getting publicity. We started getting publicity in the local papers. And so I'd show up and talk to a group, let's just say y'all were a Lions Club or something, and I would, I would say, Columbus is a really nice place to retire. I like this. I mean, I, I was genuine, but 
you know, and so then the, head, the newspaper reporter in the back would write a story. Expert says, Columbus is a great place to retire. It was a good news story. All, I mean, it's just been amazing to me. And so, so these, so, and then so they would see that, somebody else, so the next town, Albert would see it, well they'd call me, well come, you know, we want to get in on that government program. So they would call me to come over there, well I'd go over there and explain this whole program. And, uh, it, you know, so what eventually happened was, the New York Times got a hold of it. And so, they called Dan Rather from CBS News. It was <laughs> unbelievable. You know, when I first went to Jackson State University, and it's, we're up to about 9,000 students, and it's a town of uh, 10,000, so it's a college town, not a town of a college. And I told you that we're going to get national and international publicity for our program to attract retirees. They said, uh, you know what, <laughs> we enjoy talking to you this evening, but we're not, I don't think we're going to hire you. So. Uh, Sure enough, I was quoted four times in 1991 on the lead story of the New York Times about programs, or seniors recruited to save towns. <laughs> Something to that effect. Um, one, the media feeds on itself. Once that thing hit, it, then it, it was just, I was getting calls from everywhere for several years. I mean, you know, Seattle, Las Vegas, all just unbelievable. And uh, ended up getting in uh, New York Times about four times. So then, then, then we got into these uh, more meet, uh, what I would call periodicals. You know, Time, uh, Money Magazine, a lot of those things. Out there. On, they're out there on my website. Had to keep all that. It's Philip knows in academia you have to maintain your uh, mm -hmm. your uh, beta and so for promotions and so forth. So anyway, so then other states, so then I ended up going to other states like Mississippi, Tennessee, West Virginia, Virginia, to help them start up programs. It's very similar to this. And each state sort of had a different approach. Uh, Mississippi wanted to go more with certifying their towns. They didn't want to just send people to everybody. They had a little, somewhat like if you were an industrial prospect and you wanted to relocate a plant to a state, they have certain communities that have these have criteria like an acceptable piece of property or acceptable buildings and these kinds of things. So Mississippi wanted to go more with certifying their communities. We were more all inclusive because of this. We found out that here's the bottom line on retirement. One man's heaven is another man's hell. <laughs> okay? Um, I like living on a golf course, but a friend of mine out of Chicago uh, is retired from the Chicago Board of Trade. He wants to be living in downtown Chicago. Okay? Bagels, or what, I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> that's what he likes, okay? That's great. So that, and that's what, and they've been talking about baby boomers, guess what? And they were talking about them being somewhat diverse. Mm -hmm. They are. <laughs> they are very, you know, they're just not the same. So, uh, it's just, it just, even though it's hard to prove it, you know, that, that baby boomer thing we've been, they've been talking about, boomer, was sort of like a snake swallowing a mouse. Yes. And it's sort of moving on down the line. Well, what you're going to find is those are, that's 76, 77 million people is, you know, there's a large part of that that's the market. So the pie is getting bigger. This retirement market is a phenomenal market of economic uh, resources. And so what, ha what started happening was, is, is I met with these other states, and then these other, other states were saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we need to look at that too. We need to look at that. And we, we're a good place to stay. So then I went down to Arkansas. Arizona hired me to go to their, they would pick communities and send me for about three days to like Yuma, Arizona, to go in and do what I call retirement assessment. And it's in the book I'm going to give you is, is the assessment. So you go in, you're, you assess your area, your community, on what retirees are looking for, and we got it down to like a check sheet. And then you see if there's some areas you might want to improve. Um, 
and then you use that information in your promotional materials. So it's, it's part of that, that process. Uh, went down to uh, have, Lake Havasu City, Jefferson, Holbrook, Arizona, Wilcox. I mean, these were really, uh, really interesting towns, but I'd go and stay three or four days in the area. And uh, So anyway, I'm just saying, I'm assessing Columbus as a very good place. It really is. I'm just very impressed with the whole, the whole place. Uh, now, let me, let me say, let me use one story to illustrate what I've been hearing so far. I've been hearing a lot, uh, a lot of times I've been here for the conference about aging well, uh, changing, age, how aging is changing, uh, 70s, new 50, whatever, whatever you want. The 100 year old man running the marathon. Now, I, I thought that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I was talking to a lady that was 80 years old not long ago, and I do have a master's in psychiatric social work. So, I, you know, I worked three years in mental health, and so I'm talking to her, hi, how you doing? She said, well, I'm not doing so well. And I said, well, what's the matter? And she said, well, thinking of getting a divorce. And I said, oh, that's too bad. I said, I'm thinking to myself at 80, I said, well, you know, why would you want to do that? She said, because my husband's a jerk and I don't love him. I'm thinking, that's a pretty good reason. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, you, you, can, you, know, you can handle this. Just go, let's go ahead. So I said, uh, well, how long have you been married? She said, 59 years. And I said, okay. So when you were uh, uh, 29, you got married. She said, yep. Uh, how long have you been feeling this way? Oh, about 21 years. <laughs> mm. well, what makes you, you know, what makes you want to do it now or waited this long? She said, well, when I was 60, when I started feeling like this at age 60, I thought, you know what, life expectancy wasn't much <laughs> higher than that. I can, I can outweigh this guy. I think I can outlast him. You know, I can, I can make this. And uh, she said, I'm, I'm 80 years old. She said, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my last 20 years on this guy. She said, I'm ready to get out and have a good time. So, all right, talking, and this is the truth, speaking to another 80-year-old woman that just had braces put on. Her teeth, not her legs. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, ma'am, just really curious, what made you have those braces put on your teeth? She said, just straighten up. <laughs> See, this whole concept of aging, we got to change how, we look, how we're looking at this thing. These people are not, I mean, these people are active, and, and you know, we're starting to see all that. So, uh, let me just, having said all that, let me just walk you through a little bit of this. And I don't want to, it's all out there, okay? There, there are one-fourth of older people or one-fourth of the population controlling three-fourths of the financial assets. So why rob a bank? That's where the money is, okay? Uh, they're purchasing all kinds of things. Uh, doing all, they're just spending most of the travel dollars. Uh, and it's going to increase. It's just simply going to increase. Uh, oh, does anybody know, last thing on this, does anybody know why the baby boomers go from 46 to 64. Does anybody know what happened in 1964? That was the cutoff on that. You know they came back from the war started. Now, what was the, why, what was the cutoff in 64? I'll give them, what was that, what were they giving there? They said give them an Birth control pills. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so, nearly 60% of retirees own their home. Six, uh, excuse me. 60% have no mortgage. Hello, that's pretty good. 41% uh, of people buying out computers. 28 million over 55 already subscribed to Facebook. Uh, this is just some Federal Reserve, you know, they, uh, 
Basically, income and wealth is higher than young and middle aged, stable sources of income, high balance sheets, less risky due to greater diversification. So, uh, and this is a little bit about spending. This is, I'll just, I'm just going to show you what's in there if you want to really get into the slides. But there's some things that I think are a little more. This is that those migrants. Oh, I was telling you about amenity migrants. Okay, this is good. Now, another type of migrant is what we call return migrant. Okay, they return to state. They return to states where they were born after earning a pension. In Alabama, we had a lot of people leaving the state in the 70s, maybe to go to Cleveland to get a job and a plan. They'd earn a pension up there and have, you know, maybe have a house that they bought when they started working. They maybe paid, let's just say, or for round figures, 100000 By the time they retired, it was worth 300000 So they could sell that $300,000 house. They could go to Alabama for 100000 and replace or exchange that house, have 200000 to put in the bank to draw money, cut their property taxes uh, drastically. So that home exchange, and so, they weren't, those return migrants, you know, they were looking more for uh, nostalgia. Now, the amenity migrants, they would tend to congregate and gather around those lakes, beaches, mountains, and deserts. The return migrants would disperse more where they had some family, where they had some contact. Those were fairly well off, but not quite as well off financially as the amenity migrants. Now, the dependency migrants, with those people that became a little, maybe lost a spouse or got a little more dependent and uh, would want to move to where they could get some support, maybe to a ch toward a child or toward another friend or something like that. And uh, every state was going to get their share of dependency migrants. Those weren't the ones that these states I'm telling you about were interested in recruiting. So, uh, but guess what? These dependency migrants still provide a cog in the economic wheel. That's what, so they, that's what the questions were. Those questions were, what about these people that come in and are going to be sick? Well, first of all, what you, they're going to come, if they want to come and be near someone to help them, what are you going to do to stop that, number one? Number two, guess what? Even if they come in and they go, dead broke, and they end up in your nursing home, they're, on, they, 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 you know, they're poor, they're going to be on Medicaid. Guess what? Medicaid is somewhere in other different match of the state, state. Somewhere around 78% is federal money, 22% state. So even that is going to help provide jobs, whatever. But, uh, and then you also have what we call counter mining people that uh, moved from New Jersey to Florida for their 20 best years, and then when they got, they became dependent migrants, they would migrate back to New Jersey. So you had those counter migration streams. And each one of these, there are streams. There are states that send out a lot of amenity migrants. And I can tell you, uh, there's a, a lot of money involved in the people coming out of New York, transferring all those assets to Florida and the other areas. But, um, so what we're seeing is these interstate migrants are increasingly going from metro areas to smaller communities and rural areas. They, and what they kept telling me is they want to get away from those cars and that concrete. <laughs> going to states with mild climates and natural beauty, yet easy access to urban areas. They don't have to live next to the University Medical Center, but they'd like to be able to get to some specialists you know, i.e. Indiana, uh, Indianapolis or something from here. And as long as they can have a physician that they can get in to see, a dentist, maybe an ophthalmologist, and a, a few other local specialists, but if they, if they need a cardiologist or oncologist or something, just to know that there's some specialized care that they can be referred to. Uh, so, this, this, this was a 1995 to 2000 decennial uh, census 
back in 2000, and these were the states that were popular in those days. Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, Nevada, South Carolina, Florida, Alabama. That's net migrants, because each state is, is sending out migrants and they're bringing in migrants. So the net number. These were the states that were bringing in more than they were sending out. Um, it's harder, it's getting harder and harder to track that because the census bureaus changed how they do the decennial census when they count over. You had to have a, a question. If you lived in a different state uh, five years ago, is one thing, but then the age of the person is the second part of that. Uh, so I've already told you a lot about this. I don't want to go into that, but I want to tell you what this led to. This is all in the, in the book, and it's up here on the slides. But this was a little more, in case we had people that really wanted to get into the basics of that, but I think I pretty well covered that. Um, but here's what I want to get. I want to get it down to right here. Um, so, so we're getting all this publicity around the state, and we have a, a, what's called the Retirement Systems of Alabama, and it's a pension fund for uh, state teachers and state employees, and they combine it. And the director, executive director, uh, saw that well, the publicity we were generating around the state. And so we, we knew that we had these naturally occurring retirement communities, but we didn't have any planned retirement communities, resorts. So in uh, early, uh, late 18, 1989, 1900, whew, <laughs> 1990, we go to Dr. Bronner's, the man's name, and we go, look, if we could get Dale Webb to come over here and buy 2,000 acres or Cooper communities in Arkansas to come in here and develop some planned communities, would you finance it? He said, sure, go get them. Well, we went, but we, it was a hard sell. People saw Alabama as scraggly pine trees and, you know, just racial problems and a lot of problems. So um, he said, you know what? We're going to do our own. So he launched this golf club. And uh, if you were in Alabama, traveling through Alabama, now I know I got a buddy back here that goes down to South Alabama uh, for spring break and so forth. And you've seen the signs on the interstate when you pass by. Getting those signs on the interstate was a big deal. Uh, but anyway, uh, so there are 11 sites, okay, and, and we're talking about, uh, just in a nutshell, Hunts, from Huntsville, Alabama, which is in the north all the way to Mobile. You got Birmingham, Montgomery, Auburn, Dothan, Greenville, yeah, Aniston, Gadsden. And so uh, what he did, he took a map and he, of Alabama, he, he put eight pins in that map. And he said, we're not just gonna, we're not gonna do uh, just golf, uh, a few golf courses, we're gonna do a golf trip. I said, okay. <laughs> so how much is that gonna cost? Uh, about a hundred million dollars. We said, okay. You know, all of a sudden somebody's lending a little, why would you, you know, why are you gonna do that? He said, we're gonna do it to attract tourists, to enhance the quality of life, for uh, attracting industry and to attract retirees. And, and so, if somebody, if one, did that start showing up in, in the newspapers when they have an initial press conference about this? And they're going, where'd you come up with this attract retiree thing? I asked something, Fabian and them came up with the Jacksonville State. So he, he was giving us credit for that. And all of a sudden, that lent a lot of credibility because what he was saying is ideas without money remain ideas. But all of a sudden, he's like, okay, we can't, we don't, you know, this was before Alabama got Mercedes. And then actually got Mercedes, then they got uh, Honda, Hyundai, Toyota, and, and then some steel plants. I mean, all of a sudden, everything started getting better. But 
11 sites. Now that means there are 554 old golf complexes. Five, 554s and uh, 436 hole complexes and 118 hole. So that's 468 golf holes. That's 5,700 acres of golf. It's, a, it's 125 miles of concrete park path. You can play uh, 36 holes a day for 13 days and never play the same course. I mean, I'm, I don't know how else, it's, I'm trying to get across the magnitude of this thing to you. And so, so that's fine, okay. Each one of those sites had to be developed. It was a hard, hard job, but once, the, once they got the first four, then the local communities all started wanting, we want one. We want you to come over here and do it. We would like one. The legislators are telling him, yeah, well, you know, we would like one up here too. So, uh, he didn't pay anything for the land. He got all the land donated, either by private developers or the local municipality. If, if they had some city land, he would lease it, that type of thing. So once he got the golf courses built, he said, we got to have a place for these people to stay. So then they built eight hotels, Marriott or Resort, uh, excuse me, Renaissance Hotel. Then, so, then, so they've got a total of 2,065 hotel rooms. Five world-class spots. Okay, so then what started happening was uh, if you went in and built a 54-hole golf course, the real estate around that thing exploded. And then once you got the rooftops, then the commercial came. And so oh, we counted up over 8,300 houses either adjacent or on property right next to one of those developments. 500 million in commercial development. So we figured out that, it, that the retirement system ended up investing uh, around $750 million on the golf courses and the uh, hotels. And then the private developers did the housing and then commercial stuff. So, uh, <coughs> This is a 54 hole side just outside of Montgomery, and you can't even see all of it. But this was a cornfield. This was a cornfield, and uh, there was nothing off that inter the interstate exchange. So the challenge was to find world class sites, beautiful sites that were different. But that trail concept, he said, will get people to come from California or Minnesota and stay four or five days. And, and what's happened is they used to go to Arizona for the winter, they come to Alabama now because they can play all week long for what it cost them to play a couple of days out in Arizona during the winter, and they can stay in hotels five nights for what it would cost them for one night. So it didn't take them long to examine that hot horseshoe. This is a site over near uh, Auburn University, and uh, on this site, there's a hotel, 54 holes. They just had a PGA event there, when the British Open was going, the hotel there, and then up here is some uh, senior housing. So then I told him, you need to buy some property around these golf courses and build some retirement housing. So he bought seven, 700 acres over there, so now that's called National Village, and that's something we've been working on recently. This is down at uh, Point Clear, and I was telling my buddy that's been down there, you need to come over to the Grand Hotel, that's the corner point thing down there, that historic hotel I was telling you about last night. This is a place called Ross Bridge in Birmingham. U.S. Steel had 8,000 acres almost in the middle of downtown Birmingham. Probably 10 minutes from downtown Birmingham. And we got them to open it up. And so this was, this was mining and, you know, just nothing going. And once this golf course got built, it's just next, you know, of course, then you built that hotel which was modeled after uh, the one in Lake Louise in, in Canada. Then you get the, the housing just exploded because I was, you know, it just turned out to be the hot place in Birmingham. This is up near the Shoals, which is on the Tennessee River. And it's another, it's a Marriott, 36 hole across the river. It's right on the river, what they call Muscle Shoals on the Tennessee River. 
This is a 21-story tower that was there that uh, the TVA, that was a TVA tower that was dying. They, didn't, they, they were dead. It was dead in the water. He, they got him to come up there. He, looked, he got in that tower, and he said, okay, we'll, we'll build 36 holes over there. Uh, we'll build a hotel here. And they had a conference center, and I'm going to lease that conference center, and I want you to give me title of this tower. And that's how fast that happened. And those, and those council members were going, what? <laughs> and he said, you know, get me the paperwork, get going, let's go. And so, uh, so and then this is, the, this is the Renaissance that goes to downtown Montgomery where they had the parking deck. They added a performing arts center and they took the exi existing convention uh, center, civic center, and turned it into, and they beefed it up as a convention center this place is nice as any thing on Broadway. They have all kinds. So, so what started happening was they started uh, redeveloping and re-energizing downtown Montgomery and downtown Mobile. This is an old historic hotel in Mobile that's been burned three or four times since it was built in uh, 1847. And they totally refurbished it and builds a tower right behind it. And so um, they could have saved $10 million if they just torn it down and built a new one, but he wanted to, he wanted to preserve it. And so um, this is another hotel that they bought and spent $40 million on in Mobile. And so now they've changed the skyline in Mobile. That's the, that's the tower, the battle house is over there. Now they, have, they bought that office building and they bought another office building. I'm sorry, this is the title of the Battle House. That's the Renaissance Hotel I just showed you. So, um, it's just, and then this is over, that's, I actually live in that building. That's down over by the Grand Hotel I showed you just a little bit ago. So, and the reason I'm excited about, about all this, I just finished the book on the history and impact of this. Um, Construction costs four billion dollars when you look. We look at all the housing, commercial, everything I've mentioned. So if you look at the economic multipliers involved. Total eight, total output eight point five billion just from that construction spending. Two point nine total jobs seventy seven thousand jobs. And um, so they they generated more tax revenue just from the spending than the initial RSA investment. So. Now, once you get once we got those uh, assets into place, tourism on the trail trail has averaged five hundred thousand rounds per year for twenty years. Half of those people are coming from out of state. These are people that used to pass through Alabama, going from the east coast of New Orleans or going from the Midwest to Florida. Now they're stopping. In, in 2014, 568,000 rounds. All right, guess what? So, in 1990, before this got going, spending it was $3.3 billion for tourism for the state, the whole state. That, that was the largest industry. In last year, in 2014, it's up to $11.8 billion. And guess what? We still got the same Bellagraph Gardens. We still got the same Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville. Same too in Birmingham. That's the only thing that's changed was the addition, and it really helped to change the image of the state. Uh, so, people, some people have said, if, if, when Alabama did this. If Alabama hadn't done this, we would be like uh, Mississippi with no casinos right now. And then I'm not knocking Mississippi, I'm just saying. Since 1990, 90, $98 billion in extra tourism spending, $5 billion extra sales and lodging taxes, 46,000 extra tourism related jobs. 262 more hotels and 25,000 more hotel rooms. So that's an example of what tourism and retirement can do for you. 
And um, this took, Mike, Mike just taught very clear. Look at this little, look at this little track plan right here. This was a site in Dothan, Alabama, and um, I think that's somewhere around 500 acres. You see the airstrip right there? That was, there was an airstrip right there, and the owner of this, his dad ran the airstrip. The owner of this called up Dr. Bronner and said, look, I got some land I'd like to donate for you to build a, a, build, build a golf course, some of those golf courses on you do. So, okay, so that was 1990. That's that same, remember that piece of property I was telling you about? You get it now. Let me go back. That's 90. That was 2014. You can see those holes go all the way up through there. There's, there's school out there now. There's all kind of. So, to me, this, this shows the economic impact of what, what happens and what can be done. So, I talked to you about that. Um, I talked all about. So, oh, here's another quick story. Um, I'm programmed to talk in 50 minute blocks. I'm sorry, I've got, I've got a college professor. <laughs> now, financial, it's, you ever heard of Squim, Washington? I did some, there, these are mentioned in the book, there's some case studies. Squim, Washington is out near uh, Seattle. It's on Puget Sound, just south of Puget Sound. And uh, it's in what they call the banana belt out there. The mountains, Olympic Mountains, somehow block the fronts that come in and they don't get much rain. They get a lot of sun out there. And through the years, they had people coming from Hawaii, Alaska, Idaho, California, people that wanted to be on the West Coast and retired there in Squint, okay? It's not a big town. So I looked at the changes from 1970 to 1990. And what I found was, because of that influx of retirees, they went from two banks to eight, 12 churches to 20, three hotels, hotels to seven, zero golf courses to two, five physicians to 29, zero to three optometrists, two to five then restaurants, eight to 37. Oops. Real estate agencies, 10 to 23. Insurance agencies, 2 to 14. CPA, 0 to 7. Attorneys, 1 to 9, which reminded me of the uh, town that had one attorney and he was going broke. They got two and they both got rich. <laughs> so, do y'all know what's black and brown and, look, what, and looks good on an attorney? Doberman Pinscher. <laughs> now, uh, any attorneys in here? <laughs> Go too much further. No, I thought. Uh, beauty shops, 3 to 12, stockbrokers, 0 to 3, contractors, financial planners, travel bureaus. So you get in the picture here, it's clean economic development. And these people come in with money and they create a demand for services and the economy responds by providing the services. So uh, the way it happened out there, Retirees came as visitors, then they came to retire, they told their friends about it. When you get someone to relocate to your area, they're going to be the best ambassadors you've ever had. Because they're going to tell their friends, come see what, and so their friends come, and these natural streams start to develop. Their friends came, free, free market, uh, but what happened was, as more retirees came, the quality of life improved, and then it made it more attractive to other, uh, more attractive to other retirees that wanted to come. Uh, and then, as more retirees moved there, you got, got more publicity about them, and more of an identity of a new place to retire, and that sort of thing. But um, if you on this retiree attraction program. Tourists visit an area three times before they purchase, typically. They stay five nights per visit on average. One in eight visitors for retirement will buy. Eight visits per house, 500 houses equal 4,000 visitor nights to sell 500 houses. So if it's good to have them come as a tourist and spend four or five days, 
then it's better to have them come and spend 365 days. And those that move there will become the best tourists and turbo tourists because they have time to go out and money to go out and visit all the time. Uh, so this gets into what you need to do, assuming you really want to get into that. But that's in the book. I think maybe we'll, and that's all in there. Uh, why don't we, uh, y'all want to stand up, we can take a break, or we can, we can go on and get you out early. Whatever Bob, whatever, whatever Bob thinks. Maybe we should see if there are questions or, or comments. Okay. But, um, we do have some people from traditional retiree areas like Florida. Sure. You know, sure. They may want to um, yeah. counterattack. I, I, I don't mean both. <laughs> both. I'm not. I'm not uh. Uh, but I, I know um, what, why don't we see if there are questions. Yeah. Um, All right, look, what, one one yeah, question I have is uh, Mark and I have been in contact off and on for 10 or 15 years. Because I tried to get Mark to come to talk to our Chamber of Commerce and economic development, and I just, I couldn't get any traction, you know, with that. And uh, it was like they, they viewed this uh, economic development as competitive to traditional, you know, industrial development. And it just didn't want to hear it, you know, even though we have a good number of people that come to Columbus, um, um, just to visit the community and they end up living here. So how, how, what strategy would you have, uh, would you suggest for, for getting some interest, you know, in communities about this form of economic okay. development? Um, two things. One is we started getting questions from states like Michigan and Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, that were losing a lot of their retirees because all that stuff I just told you about that it's good when they come in and bring it, bring it with them, it's bad when they leave and take it with them. And so, you know, because these people, these people are not committing crimes when they come to town. They're not uh, taxing your welfare system. They're not taxing your schools. And they make good citizens. They volunteer. They go church, they, but they're looking, you know, this, these centers are really important, but the thing is, states that realize that they wanted to start changing their, uh, the way they tax the states, and uh, inheritance taxes, and they even want to say, you know, income taxes, you know, because you start looking, Florida does not have an income tax. So, excuse me? Texas doesn't Texas doesn't either. So state, state governments were looking, those legislatures were looking at, well, maybe we can do something to keep all these people from leaving. Well, you know, unfortunately, the, the four season climate and the warmer area, because as people get older, they don't like to deal with the snow as much. They, they're, they're colder, they can fall on the ice, and there are just issues with that. And so, um, you know, the weather has, has somewhat has a lot to do with some of that, especially for those that enjoy outdoor recreation. But, so, that's one thing. The other thing is that... So, so Mark, can I start with Yes, ma'am. Do you think for those particular states, this is not really a big model? No, I'm not going to say that, because what happened was, when I was talking about, uh, I was talking to Philip about this yesterday, what happened was, traditionally, people were, were migrating long distances to these planned retirement areas or these... Uh, communities, undiscovered communities, because once they got discovered, it's kind of like what the Yogi Berra said when they said, well, we're going to dinner tonight, and he said, we're not, somebody said, let's go to the yacht over there, and he said, no, we're not going there, uh, it's too too crowded, nobody goes there anymore. So, the, you know, once once the, the good place is sort of filled up, uh, people stopped migrating such long distances and the developers started taking the communities to the areas. And I talked about Huntley near Chicago. So smaller developments closer to the population centers where people don't have to leave their area because of their families and because of the nostalgia and their friends and stuff that they have. So, uh, but 
Indiana's not a state that I was typically thinking about as a retirement destination. But the things I mentioned from the top, it's a very attractive place. And, and, and I've been feeling, feeling very comfortable here. And, um, you know, just like there was a lady from Wisconsin that had lunch with us. And she said, Wisconsin has four distinct seasons. You know, winter is a distinct season up here. But anyway, um, so one man's heavens, another man's hell. And, and I've never wanted to be quoted or say what well, some place is not a good place to retire because somebody, it's wherever somebody can find a fulfillment. So uh, it just, you know, if you look at the look at the trends, more people have moved out of the, the snow belt and rust belt states to the sun belt states. Um, I have a question, kind of um, some of the things I've read, and Ken Dyquote is one of them that talks about this, is that the boomers, you were building in 1990, so you were building for the, for the silent generation. The boomers are now 51 and 69. So they're going to be the new retirees. And one of the things that he said is that they're not going to want to live in communities where everybody's the same. That they're going to want more diversity within their community. Uh, have you thought yeah. about that? Yeah, and here again, uh, some, some retirees want to be around uh, only older people. They don't want to be around kids. They don't want to hear kids. Some want to be in a town that has a football team so they can go to the football game. So they can, they don't, you know, they don't want to just be around right. nothing but old people. Yeah. They might see that in the press. So here again, it's, it's such an individual thing. But the point is, if you don't move anymore before you get 65, it gets increasingly harder to do so. Because I just went through that process myself. And I've been talking about it all these years. I've been trying to make a career out of retirement. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to have to practice what I've been talking about. So we moved. From North East Alabama down to Fairhope, down on the coast, and um, I guess do, is there any concern that in 20 years all these communities that you've built for a certain age group are not going to be as much in demand? Here, here's what seems to happen: um, some of the communities that are very popular. Um, they say, we don't want to keep telling people about this place. We like it, just like it is. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You're not going to stay the same. You're either going to progress or you're going to regress. And if you don't have some fresh blood coming in, you're going to die on the vine. And I could show you a ghost town in eastern New Mexico that had a, a, a church pit was their main industry. And that church pit closed and they were like, uh, everybody stayed there until they died. When they died, they boarded up their houses. Crazy thing. But if you have younger retirees coming in, they can buy the homes of the people that just lost their, they're looking to scale down, go from 3,000 in the yard, big yard to maintain, older to a condo or to some sort of a congregation facility where they got less to maintain. And then eventually, those people might end up going to attended living or assisted assisted living, maybe eventually to some sort of long-term care. Mm -hmm. Well, in order for that to happen each right. time, right. people have to move in behind them. So, you know, you just have to look at the existing housing stock in the community, and, and uh, when people are assessing, like you know, I have, I, I just read some stuff that was in retired. Uh, where the entire magazine, where Columbus was mentioned, Bob got mentioned prominently in the center, and they were talking about some of the neighborhoods. You know, when you go into a census place, you obviously have to look at well, how much would it cost me to live there. I was out in, you ever been to uh, Santa Barbara, California? So Bain is up in the wine country just uh, east of there. And I was out there in June a few years back, and um, it was June, 75 degrees, no humidity, bright sunshine. I'm going, man, this is pretty good. I'm like, man, you know. And then I look over here, 
there's a two-bedroom house over here, and I go, small house, look to me, it'd be about 12, 1,400 square feet. And I said, how much, how much would that house go for? Oh, me and two. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> now I'm getting it. So, but the thing was, people that had those houses, if they could sell those, they could come to the south, the south they could come to Columbus, and they could buy a lot of houses and, and replace that house and have a whole lot of money left over. So they're, they're starting to break the code on that. Well, one thing I can observe, because we do have retirees that move into this community, and, and oftentimes if they either have grandchildren, like you say, in sure. the or they have children or grandchildren that, that are in, the, in proximity to Cruz, is that some of our best volunteers at Mowry Center are retirees who have moved in to Columbus. And they have, in general, they have a greater appreciation for what we offer here than the longtime residents do. You know, so they make for good, for good folks. And uh, if nothing else, for those of you that run a senior center or whatever, at least help your politicians understand, your local politicians understand that we're not a drain on our community over here. We're providing a service that makes our community attractive to older people that are some of the best citizens we have here. And what I found was the most successful local politicians were those that took, took care of their older people and their children. If you, can, if you do that, the rest of them are gonna be okay. So, uh, nothing else, if you, if you take nothing else, you don't have any interest in attracting and working on this, at least take that much away. But if you do have some interest in this is something uh, we could do, um, and, and let me take, and we'll wrap, about to wrap up, let me take just five more minutes here to, to go through some, some of the communication changes. I mean, if you want to go find, and it's all out here, but this is communicating with these folks. I've talked about some of that, but let me, this is the part uh, that's interesting, the new, the, the digital market. Okay, and, and maybe this, you can use some of this for what you're doing. Uh, websites, mobile, email, social media, search, online advertising, mobile apps, Facebook, e news, blogs, ebooks, videos. So that's the way people are reaching people anymore. Look at this. At the end of 2013, there were 3.6 billion email accounts. Can be up to 20 times more cost effective. 65% opened on the smartphone or tablet. 64% opened on the subject line alone. So what we did, I've been, I was in cut contact with marketers. How can we get the word out more about these communities to all this, these amazing people out there looking for a place to come? Smartphone activities, 78% email, 73% web, 70% Facebook, 64% uh, map, 60% games, 57 search, and photo share, 53%. So anyway, there's the book. We'll, we'll have those for you in the back. Uh, some of them may have left. But basically, this covers the economic impact, all the academic studies, those longitudinal studies, what states that we're doing, how to implement a strategy, the market and updated bibliography. So um, I'll stay as long as anybody wants to talk about this. I uh, appreciate your attention. It, it may be something you can take back to some people in your town. And uh, any politician that has gotten on this, uh, when, when I was going around, when we first getting started with this, and so they would introduce me, they would say, and yeah, and here's Dr. Fagan, he's with the governor's program. One guy introduced me and said, he's with the governor's program to attack retirees. <laughs> <laughs> attract, attract. <laughs> uh, but it's been, it's, I've had, you know, I've just, I've had met so many nice people and I've just loved doing this. So it's long I've been in on them. So it's, it's a great thing and, uh, Thank you. Whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.